Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program here. Um, today's event marks the 15th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo. We've done this many years in the past, and we didn't necessarily expect that we'd be doing this 15 years after the opening of the facility. Uh, but we have a, a wonderful panel uh, to talk about this and to engage you in a discussion about it. Andy Worthington, who uh, wrote <coughs> really the first book that, um, and, and also produced the research that really explained who was actually in Guantanamo, because it's hard to remember, but 10 years ago or so, it wasn't even clear who was actually being held in the facility. Uh, Tom Wilner, who of course uh, argued the one of the most important cases in the modern era, which is Rasul versus Bush, which allowed ha habeas corpus uh, for the uh, prisoners at the facility. Rosa Brooks, who had a play, who is a uh, ASU uh, Future of War Fellow at New America, a professor at Georgetown, and also uh, played a key role in the Obama uh, Defense Department in the policy shop. And finally, uh, Congressman Jim Moran, who represented the 8th District in Virginia, and has long been a vocal critic of uh, the Guantanamo facility. Um, so why don't we start with Andy, and we'll just work towards Congressman Ra Moran. Am I standing up there? Or you can do whatever you here? would like, whatever you feel I'll is just, comfortable. I'll just sit here. And sit. Hello, glad to see you here. Um, obviously, it would be nice if there were more people here. That's frequently a problem with Guantanamo. I was just at the protest um, outside the Supreme Court where rights groups get together every year, and I don't think we managed 100 <laughs> people. You would think that it is a, you know, a, 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 an, a, an item of trivial insignificance, the existence of Guantanamo, but I've been involved in this story for over 10 years because there's a fundamental problem with Guantanamo which countries like the United States and my country, the UK, are not supposed to be involved in, which is holding people indefinitely without charge or trial. This is a hallmark of tyrannies. Uh, this is something that you know, the barons in my country, a little over 800 years ago, uh, first set the ball rolling for habeas corpus, which of course only applied to the barons initially, but eventually spread around the world and became something that is supposed to protect all of us, all of us, from executive tyranny. And yet, 55 men are still in Guantanamo, and the only way any of those men can be released is at the whim of the, the United States government. There is no there is no legal process whereby those men can be guaranteed release. There was for a short time in this long and now, now very long and sad history, a time when the prisoners had been granted habeas corpus rights, constitutionally guaranteed by the Supreme Court in 2008, which Tom worked on. And for a few years, there was a golden period, the only time in Guantanamo's history when judges ordered the release of prisoners because the government had failed to come up with sufficient evidence to hold them, and those men were released. And then what happened was that the uh, appeals, appeals court judges, for what appeared to be nakedly ideological political reasons, shut down the habeas corpus litigation. They were acting on the, um, through the drive of Justice Department lawyers at no point under the Obama administration were the Justice Department lawyers who worked on these cases told, either by President Obama or by Eric Holder, that um, they should stop fighting every case when Guantanamo prisoners were trying to get out of the prison. They, they have fought every single case that has come before them. Um, and the prisoners ended up being abandoned by all three branches of the United States government. And the sad situation that we're in now is that although President Obama um, began to speed up the releases of prisoners and the reviews for prisoners, the periodic review boards, which are for prisoners who have not already been approved for release and are not facing trials. Um, and these were taking place two a week last year, and they have ended up with um, deciding that 38 out of 64 men whose cases were reviewed were approved for release. These are men who were described by the previous review process as either too dangerous to release, but insufficient evidence existed to put them on trial, or they were, um, or they were put forward for, for prosecution, but the basis for prosecution largely collapsed under scrutiny by appeals court judges. So we're, we're, we're now today with 55 men 
with 19 of those men approved for release but still held, with the hope that before President Obama leaves office, the majority of those 19 will be freed, but without the closure of Guantanamo, as was promised eight years ago. And that will be the black mark on Obama's legacy, which we all said from the beginning it was going to be if he didn't fulfill it. And it's, it's absolutely true that he faced unprincipled and unacceptable opposition in Congress, but it's also, I believe, true that he didn't act early enough and urgently enough to have tackled Congress, to have got this place closed. It should have closed. And now here we are with the prospect of Donald Trump and on, all of us, I suspect, honestly, really not knowing what to expect. But my feeling being that the least bad thing that he will do is that he will shut the door on anybody else being freed from Guantanamo. Um, and we will then, those of us who care, will then have to tell him very forcefully, you have men here who have been approved for release by high-level government review processes. You must release them. And you also have the ongoing process of the periodic review boards, which work like parole boards, where people are able to make a case that the government has no good reason to continue holding them. That must also happen. But we don't know what to expect. I'll stop now. I think we're all here to talk about the possibilities rather than you know, looking too much back on Obama, looking to what we might expect. And um, I, I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I think the first question, and I prepared nothing, so <laughs> let me just come off of Andy. Uh, you know, people around the country ask, why does Guantanamo matter? Why does it still matter? There are only 55 people there. There's so many big issues around. We have confirmation hearings for an attorney general today. Well, why you sh should you care about Guantanamo? To me, it matters. It's really what Andy said at the beginning. It's symbolic of what we stand for as a nation. Guantanamo was set up for the specific purpose of avoiding the law. The Bush administration felt that the law was an impediment to be avoided in the war against terror. I think it's a fundamental mistake, and it's, it's, it's not what we believe in. So they took foreigners outside the sovereign territory and said they have no legal rights. Um, and that's, unfortunately, the way it still exists. Although we won some cases before the Supreme Court, the D.C. Circuit has basically taken legal rights away from the people of Guantanamo. That's something fundamentally inconsistent with what this country was founded on. And as long as that exists, uh, we have like a boil and our system that needs to be uh, solved. It's our ideals, you know, I, I used to say this in speeches. Um, Ronald Reagan said that the great strength of the nation is not its wealth or its power, but its ideals, and its ideals of individual liberty protected by the rule of law and democracy, which makes us strong around the world. Guantanamo is directly against that. As Andy said, I, you know, I walk by the White House each day on the way to work, rather than driving now. It's the only exercise I get. And I can remember eight years ago, the surge of hope going by the White House that Obama was coming in, and that Bush was leaving. I, I couldn't believe that we'd ever have anything worse than George Bush, whom, by the way, I went to school with. But he had no understanding about the ideals of this country. And I, I'm so depressed now, eight years later, that we're going maybe into something worse, so at least somebody who doesn't understand what's going on. And I do blame Obama. I can be very specific about it, but I will say I worked closely with the Obama transition team on the order that they entered the first day in office to close Guantanamo within a year. It was easy to do. Obama didn't do it. Not only did he not do that, um, his Justice Department, as Andy said, we won a case before the Supreme Court saying that the people of Guantanamo really have the constitutional right to habeas corpus. There were then some crazy decisions entered into by the D.C. Circuit with the Justice Department pushing them, saying they may have habeas corpus rights, but they have no due process rights. It's a crazy thing. It made no sense. And, then <laughs> said, and, even, and any evidence presented by the government has got to be presumed to be accurate. So no one could win a case anymore. It was crazy. Those cases which every law school professor would say are crazy, the Obama administration has aggressively asserted to deny habeas corpus. They've resisted our attempts to get it reversed 
It's, it's amazing. I think it will be a black mark on his legacy, and I, I look at him as a real failure. What now? Uh, what do we do now, what we expect? I, I have a few thoughts, and I'm glad that Congressman Jim Moran is here. I think we have confused what protects our security. We think we protect our security by being tough and beating the hell out of people or torturing them or something. Uh, we need symbols again like Jim Moran or Jack Murtha, who nobody questioned that these guys were people who would never compromise the security of this nation. Uh, they were strong in the way they looked, the way they talked, and yet they believed strongly in human rights and the values of America. We need spokesmen like Jim talking about these today to set the balance of how we protect our security. Um, I think also the country needs to become much more aware of our values again. I encourage everyone, I wish we were on TV, to contribute to Sandra Day O'Connor's organization, iCivics, which is dedicated to teaching people in America what it means to be an American, about the government, what the values of the country are. Other than that, I, you know, I guess with Trump, um, Andy and I just wrote an op-ed saying uh, maybe Trump, and trying to appeal to him because Guantanamo is so stupidly expensive, it costs about $11 million a prisoner each year to keep it open, that, you know, wh why are you doing that? That's a bad deal for America, Donald. Be the president who does a business thing and closes it. I don't know. We'll need to see what happens. So, that's it. Thank you. Here we go. Thanks. Um, I think I'll just say more explicitly what I think you both said implicitly, which is that at this point the problem with Guantanamo is not Guantanamo anymore. The problem with Guantanamo is that the United States of America has a continued to hold people who we acknowledge we have no basis for holding, and B, continues to hold people based on a really forced uh, interpretation of the law of armed conflict uh, into what amounts to indefinite detention based on future dangerousness, which, which as Andy suggests, runs deeply, deeply counter to sort of any understanding of, of the rule of law and any understanding of what the Anglo-American legal tradition uh, uh, says is most important. Um, it wouldn't make any difference. I, I, I sometimes see, and I, I suspect this audience knows this already, but I, but I sometimes see uh, suggestions in the press that if only, if only President Obama hadn't faced congressional opposition to moving the detainees to, a, say, a supermax facility in the United States. Um, if only that hadn't happened, we, there would be no issue. You know, if we had simply been able to move everybody to the United States, there, there wouldn't be any issue and the, the sort of open sore of Guantanamo would be gone. That would be, from my perspective, uh, at this point irrelevant. I think it is absolutely correct, as Tom says, that the initial impulse of the Bush administration to put people at Guantanamo Bay was based on a belief, which luckily, thanks to the efforts of Tom and others, uh, the Supreme Court ultimately repudiated based on a belief that Guantanamo was a sort of a law-free zone outside of the jurisdiction of U.S. courts entirely. Um, and so they put it there, and it understandably became, became a symbol of all sorts of bad things, including, in, in, including the use of torture, uh, uh, as well as issues relating to who was being detained and on what legal basis they were being detained. Um, that was true at the origin. I think at this point, it makes no particular difference where it is, Guantanamo, Illinois, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, the problem goes much deeper than that. And, and I, it's true, it's hard to get people to care about it 15 years later because we get bored, it seems like a small problem, but you know, as with any, any single individual who's been unjustly detained, it doesn't get better the more time that goes by, and it gets worse the more time that goes by. And I, I share Tom's, uh, Tom's strong view that this, in, in, in many ways, is a real failure of the Obama administration, that there, were, there was room to change this, and a combination of uh, uh, bureaucratic inertia uh, and a sort of political cowardice kept, kept the administration from doing what I think at the outset President Obama knew he should do and believed he should do. Um, I think that um, I wanted to just broaden this a little bit by, by noting, and hopefully we can, we can talk about this a little bit more in the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm always haunted by the 
uh, some of the famous lines in, in Justice Jackson's famous dissent in the Korematsu case. Uh, this is the case involving Japanese internment during World War II where, where he, he says, uh, he talks about, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to dig this up and, and quote it for you, um, Justice Jackson was not necessarily opposed to the idea of interning Japanese Americans. He was, however, strongly opposed to having the Supreme Court say, oh, that's fine. Uh, and he basically <laughs> said, look, yeah, but let's draw a distinction between in the middle of a war, military commanders are going to do all, all kinds of things, including things that we will, in hindsight, think are, are legally and constitutionally questionable, we think that they shouldn't do. And he essentially says, I'm kind of OK with that. That's all right. Um, uh, but courts should not ratify uh, and come up with constitutional justifications for such actions. Um, and he made an argument which I think uh, is particularly true of, of judicial ratification, but frankly in many ways is, is, is also true of the kind of executive branch um, codification and regularization of practices, one administration after another, that, 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 that when President Obama came in, yes, we all thought he was going to close Guantanamo. We all thought, and indeed, he, he pledged to turn the, close the door on uh, some of the dubious uh, legal interpretations pioneered by the Bush administration. Um, instead, he ended up, to a significant extent, uh, I think the issue of torture was one where he, he did very important and good things, but on the other issues, actually extending uh, extending and further buttressing the legal arguments made by the Bush administration. Here's the, here's the line from Korematsu. He says, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's see. A military order, however, constitution, however unconstitutional, is not apt to at last longer than the military emergency. Even during that period, a succeeding military commander may revoke it all, but once a judicial opinion rationalizes an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court has for all time validated in the Korematsu case the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens but the, the lines that I think are always very haunting. The, the principle then lies about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Uh, if we review and, and approve uh, what a military commander does, the passing incident becomes the doctrine of the Constitution. There it has a generative power of its own, and all that it creates will be in its own image. And in many ways, I, I think of that when I think of the ways in which the Obama administration on indefinite detention, uh, but also on some of the legal theories that have justified a sort of endlessly expanding war on terror with no geographic boundaries, no clearly defined enemy, no clarity on exactly what level of evidence or kinds of evidence suffice to determine that someone is a combatant. This has an impact not, it has an impact both on who we decide that we can detain uh, indefinitely on law of war grounds for the duration of the conflict, um, but it also has implications for who we think we can kill. And this is obviously work that New America, and Peter in particular, has done very important work on uh, US targeted strikes, drone strikes, colloquially. Uh, but what we have ended up with as a result of legal theories developed during the Bush administration, but embraced and expanded under the Obama administration is essentially a, a Justice Department, uh, uh, a Justice Department approved doctrine that permits an administration to base decisions on who to detain or who to kill on classified information that is not examined by any external judicial body, uh, that is not revealed where the, the in the case of, of targeted strikes, the strike itself is not acknowledged. Uh, so we, we detain people and we kill them in secret based on secret evidence evaluated during a secret process by unnamed individuals. And that is frankly a pretty shitty place for a democracy to be, if you'll excuse my language. That was a legal term. That was a legal <laughs> term. <laughs> and, and it is totally independent of whether, I mean, you can think that and also think these are wonderful people making these decisions and I'm sure in fact they always made the decision I would have agreed with. I, I tend to think that, generally speaking, usually the case. I know some of the people involved in those decisions. They're good people, they're conscientious people, they're careful people, but it's the principle which lies about like a loaded gun which we are now handing to President-elect Donald Trump. You finished? I don't, uh, I don't want to cut you short because that's done. good stuff. <laughs> well, my next chapter, I assume, is then. 
<coughs> I'm uh, humbled, really, to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, Andy, you've devoted much of uh, it, your adult life to this issue of Guantanamo, and I really admire you for it. Uh, Tom, we're friends. You know how fond I am of you, I trust. Uh, I admire your intellect and, most importantly, your uh, character. Uh, I didn't know that you went to school with George Bush, although <laughs> I'm sure you didn't go to class with him. <laughs> it's an important distinction. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, Rosa, uh, if any of you have not read her book about the Pentagon and the war machine just taking over the federal government, Today, you really need to do that. Well, they don't need to she read it, they just need to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. It's, a, it's not that expensive. It would be, a, 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 that would be a, at least a gesture toward, uh, uh, you know, enlightening our country. It's, a, it's very well written, and she knows what she's talking about. Uh, it, I don't know if you also know she was named after Rosa Luxemburg and Rosa Parks, and she has not disappointed her parents. So uh, she's terrific, and, and I was really excited when Tom told me that she was gonna be on the panel. And, and Peter, um, uh, thank you for all that you have done. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, your understanding of what jihad, what we call jihad, uh, understand what that's all about, what we're really f uh, fighting in terms of the supposed global war on terrorism, it, it's, it's just so helpful, so, it so enlightens the international conversation. And if you have not read Peter Bergen's articles, you have done your mind an injustice. So buy them, read them, most of them you can get for free, because the I mean, magazines are so on. But, but you huh? should buy the books. You, they should buy the books, and there's, there's two or three of them that you really need to buy. So, Anyways, uh, I, I greatly admire this uh, panel that uh, I'm humbled to be part of. Uh, but th Tom and Rosa are wrong <laughs> in uh, blaming Obama. Most of us liberals uh, just assumed he was going to be the great black hope, and he was going to do everything perfectly. He was going to change the world. He was going to accomplish everything that needed to be done. All of his rhetoric was going to be fulfilled in practice, and uh, you know the the world was going to be a better place, and and uh, you know a wonderful song of John Lennon's was going to actually be actualized all over the world. Yeah, kumbaya, but it didn't happen, and it's not uh, President Obama's fault. And in fact, uh, I think he, history is going to treat him very well. He was a good man and a good president, and we're going to miss him terribly uh, as of January 20th and for the next uh, four years. So um, uh, it wasn't his fault. Um, it's the fault of the American people. You know, um, we have over time since uh, uh, for the last roughly 250 years. We, we really set the standard for human rights, equal justice under the law, uh, for uh, uh, you know, inclusivity, et cetera. And, um, and there are many reasons for that, but we really have evolved. Our leadership has evolved. Uh, we've been, for the most part, very fortunate in the leaders that we have elected. I mean, there are a few that we could have done without, you know, Andrew Johnson comes to mind, Millard Fillmore, and frankly, I wasn't all that impressed with W. But, but um, for the most part, we set the standards for the rest of the world. But there are indelible stains on the soul of this country. Uh, slavery, obviously, was one. The genocide of the American Indian uh, was another. In, in modern times, uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans certainly, um, you know, sticking our fist into the hornet's nest of Iraq uh, is going to go down as one of the worst mistakes because of the 
uh, consequences for so many people and their ongoing. But Guantanamo is going to go down the history books as, uh, uh, as one of those uh, indelible stains on our soul because it is so averse to what we believe in. We tolerated it. We deliberately let it happen. The principal reason is that the, and, and, and thank you for setting the tone here, Rosa. The, the principal reason is that the American people, by and large, don't give a shit about Guantanamo. Out of sight, out of mind. If you hear about anything about it, other than President Obama talking about it on the campaign trail, which is what got us so excited, it's from talk radio, hate radio, and to some extent Fox. But where are our leaders? This is one of the most important issues still facing America. And you know, we've got the five of us who, uh, uh, you know, these are great folks, but uh, uh, we don't have members of Congress for frankly obvious reasons and, and we've got what three dozen folks here in the audience. Uh, I thank you for being here because you, um, I, I, I'm assuming that means that you care about this issue. So thank you for that. But it's an indictment of our country. Uh, now, I offered 15 amendments on Guantanamo in the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, in the full committee. Well, actually, it was far more than 15. If you include every subcommittee bill that came up, it's more than twice that. Because they all had language prohibiting any transfer of detainees from Guantanamo. I lost every single one of them. And on the House floor was the worst vote. Time and again, we'd bring it up and we'd lose, to the point where nobody really listened. Jerry Nadler would come up and speak. He represents Greenwich Village. I'm sure he's one of your heroes. So uh, uh, sometimes Adam Schiff, a thoughtful guy. Uh, once in a while, maybe Earl Blumenauer, maybe George Miller. Or but the fact that I can remember the names of the people who would speak up on Guantanamo out of 435 members of the House says something, too. And the reason is that they knew their constituents didn't care. And that's why we're, we are where we are. And that's why it's not President Obama's fault. Rahm Emanuel, who, uh, while he's, he's not transactional in a financial sense, he's transactional in a political sense. As chief of staff, he knew that there's virtually no support on this. He could have made a difference if he had really cared. I don't want to particularly turn it on Rom because he's got enough problems in Chicago now. But with everything that the president tried to do, there were people in Justice Department, in the Pentagon, in Homeland Security that resisted it. And when the, when the permanent workforce, the civil service, decides they're going to stop something, it's going to be stopped. And then there were staff, particularly on the House Armed Services Committee, who reveled in coming up with tougher and tougher language. I'm not sure how many of them ever went down to Guantanamo, but if they did, they got the party line. How many of you have been to Guantanamo? Two of you, uh -huh. There's not much to see now. But that's what this is about. The president didn't get any support. No political support. There are a few of you who were willing to speak up, but very, very few. Very, very few understood what this means in terms of the definition of what our country stands for. This is so counter 
to the very principles that form the foundation of the establishment of this democracy. Of our whole judicial system, Hillary got it, Colin Powell got it, John Kerry certainly got it. They'd go overseas and they'd start talking about human rights. And what'd they hear about? Guantanamo. And it gets worse. You know, when we see these horrific beheadings of good, honorable, decent people that happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and get captured by ISIS, why do you think that they dress them up in orange jumpsuits? They're trying to send a message just about Guantanamo. Now, that doesn't excuse it by any means. When, when those folks are targeted, it doesn't particularly bother me, even when it's by drones and so on. So I'm not giving them any excuse. But we ought to understand what the message is that they are able to recruit because of what we've done at Guantanamo. It helps their recruitment. Maybe they could still recruit. Maybe they would still have ISIS. All of that, maybe all of that would have existed. But why do we so deliberately help the enemy? It's just so wrong. Now, there are so many other aspects of this, and some of them are just so outrageous that you, know, it, you don't know whether to laugh or cry. I'm not going to get into them unless you ask about them. And, will share them. But uh, let me start, let me end where I started. Uh, thank all of you for caring enough to come to this and at least try to keep uh, this little spark of indignation over what we're doing uh, to our judicial system, to our values, trying to keep that spark alive so you know, maybe at some point in the future at least we'll learn the right lesson from it and never let it happen again. Peter? Thank you, everybody. That was, everybody, that was all brilliant. Uh, let, me, let me ask, uh, let me start with Andy a question, which is, so the 55 people left, 55 men left, how many are going to go on trial? You said 19 have been cleared for release. Uh, and how many are in this sort of nebulous, too dangerous to release category? So the number of people facing trials or having faced trials is 10. And the other 26 men are all subject to further reviews in the periodic review boards. But they were established through an executive order issued by President Obama. It could be, it could be overturned by Trump. Yeah. Um, you know, which is why I say the particular issue that we all need to be aware of to say to him from the very beginning is you cannot shut the door on everybody and treat them all as people who you can just lock away and throw away the key and forget about them. How many people have been released under Obama? Um, something like, um, something in the 180s, I think. Uh, 178. Right, that's that's today. Yeah. Isn't it? That, is there an update? 178? No, no, that's yeah. it. That's that, it. And that's a not insignificant number. No, no, no. I mean, it's, you know, it, as it's, it, it was great what you said, Jim, because you really perfectly explained the depths of the opposition. I still think that he could have overcome that, but I understand how bad it was. And I think he's achieved a lot in the position that we're at. It's just he did not do the final thing. And now we don't know what, what's going to happen. Um, OK, so let me ask you, I mean, uh, it, obviously it's hard to predict the future, but let me throw out a couple of things that might happen. And let's assess what you it, let's collectively assess and then open it to questions as well. So. The Obama administration has done a pretty good job of sending uh, non-American alleged terrorists to the Southern District of New York, where they've had very quick trials, and you know there's been <coughs> none of the things that were supposed to happen, which is you know attacks on the Southern District, or we'd have to close Manhattan down, or all these sort of like scare tactics that were used in the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed case. None of that happened. So I mean, I, I don't know how many you would probably know, Andy, but my guess is there've been at least a dozen trials of foreign terrorists who would have. Who, who you know, were serious players, I mean, Bin Laden's son-in-law and others. So in the future, the Trump administration could easily send those people to Guantanamo. There'd be absolutely no impediment. And, I, and I, why would we presume they wouldn't? I guess is the first question. Well, I would hope that what's going to happen is that, you know, apart from, apart from the odd person who isn't thinking straight that he talks to, most people will say to him, 
the federal courts work? What is the, what is the point of sending people to Guantanamo when we can prosecute them in federal court and we have a robust record of doing that? And, you know, and I would hope that people are saying to him, the only reason that people, the, the way Guantanamo came in the picture was to avoid the law. So what are you going to do? You want to get into torturing again? And what we're certainly hearing is that he's been giving, being given a lot of advice sensibly that torture is not on the cards. Torture is demonstrably illegal. Okay, and but let's take that off the table because I think that it, it seems bringing back torture would, it's, there's a legal impediment to doing that. We've got lawyers and here, I mean, there are statutes that prevent that right now is my understanding. That it would be, right, Rosa? Tom? Um, <clears throat> there have always been statutes that have prevented. Right. Uh, so it was done before um, in Guantanamo and elsewhere based on legal opinions from the Justice Department which reinterpret those statutes and reinterpreted what torture meant. I mean, you know, John Yu and Gonzalez and, and David Addington just used their power as lawyers to change the statute, which is disgusting, and they should be indicted for it, by the way. Um, that could be done again if you have the Justice Department willing to do that. Let, let me make another point, um, and it's what Andy said. Unfortunately, despite the Supreme Court cases we won, Guantanamo is still a place outside the law because the D.C. Circuit has entered opinions gutting the Supreme Court. So it would matter if people the difference in putting somebody in Guantanamo rather than in the United States, is in the United States, anyone, a citizen or a foreigner, has constitutional rights. That's accepted. Since Yick Wo Hopkins or whatever it was in 1867, if you're in Guantanamo and you're a foreigner, you still only have the right to habeas corpus, but you have no right to due process, no other constitutional rights. So. The only reason to use Guantanamo now would be to put a foreigner there to say he doesn't have constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. And Obama, this is one thing I disagree, and I need to send you the stuff I sent the Obama administration. They could have changed that with a stroke of a pen, and they have left that loaded gun for, for and it's, it's a great thing, I love yeah. that though. Uh, Jackson, by the way, was the best writer ever. But the loaded gun for Trump to use. They could use Guantanamo as a place to put foreigners outside the law. Now, right. otherwise, an American or any, make no sense. It's just much more expensive. You can put them anywhere, you know. So, but it, that is open now as a lawless enclave still. And I, I want to return to the question because why, why would we presume that won't happen? I, I think you, you presume it probably will. Okay. And, and then I presume they're going to be tortured too. I, I would. I mean, well, let, let's drill in on that one for a second. So, I, 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 <laughs> wouldn't it be, um, I, my, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, my understanding of this is maybe cartoonish. You're much better for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there are, aren't there sort of several orders of problem with the, let's say, coercive, let's, let's take the word torture away just for a second because it's open to interpretation. But let's use, use the coercive interrogations as we all can agree there's a, interrogations which are uncoercive and then a coerced. So a coercive interrogation, uh, wouldn't there be resistance, I think, from the intelligence community to implement this? Wouldn't there be, uh, a DO, Guantanamo is a DOD facility, it's against the Army Field Manual, and isn't it c correct that there is some statutory language? I mean, the problem with Obama is he's done everything by executive order. That can be easily overturned. But in the one issue on torture, my impression is, is that there is some statute that would make it very hard to kind of roll back the tape to John Yu. Is that correct? But the statutes okay. were always there. They, the statutes, yeah. they're not new statutes. It's statutes that were there during Bush and yeah. afterward. It was the interpretations of the Justice Department which loosened up the interpretation of what was prohibited. Right. That could happen again. Rosa? Um, I, I guess and no. So, Current law restricts uh, the methods of interrogation to those listed in the Army and Marine Corps field manuals, which, right. which do not include such things as waterboarding. I, I, that being said, number one, I, I would 
dispute the premise that there's a co coercive and non-coercive. Nobody is voluntarily being interrogated. It's, it's a continuum of unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, at what point does the level of unpleasantness rise to something that constitutes cruel and human or degrading treatment or torture? Once the Supreme Court decided that common Article Three of the Geneva Convention's provisions, which include a prohibition on cruel and human degrading treatment, applies to the armed conflict between the US and Al-Qaeda and its endlessly morphing associates, mm. uh, that provides, I think that provides some protection. Obviously, it gives, it gives those who want to make sure that we don't return to uh, uh, using techniques that we think are immoral and unlawful mm. a pretty powerful tool themselves to use. But, but I do share the concern that I share the concern that the things that we have heard from Donald Trump himself suggest a willingness to use every available tactic to turn that around. Um, I think that on the one hand, I, I do think that there is substantially more and more thoughtful and more self-conscious opposition in the intelligence community and the military community now that, that he would face if he tried to do that, but I am not so confident that that would, that's no guarantee. I mean, as, as, as Tom says, as, as we saw the last time around, you know, if you're, if you are, and, and this, when, when, when candidate Donald Trump said things like, I'm gonna bring back waterboarding in a hell of a lot worse, and I'm gonna go after the terrorist families because that's what you've gotta do, there was this rash of op-eds and so forth from military leaders saying, you know, people saying, oh, those would be illegal, those would be war crimes, the US military will never commit war crimes. The problem, of course, as we know, is that even Donald Trump would not say, I order you to commit war crimes, which, yes, any member of the US military would say, no can do, sir. Mm. Uh, the problem is that that's not the way it would work. It would be, it would be, I need to find a bunch of lawyers to reinterpret that statute one more time, and I need to find a bunch of, you know, tame lawyers in the Justice Department who will tell me that, these things that I want to do don't actually constitute right. the prohibited techniques because they're ever so slightly different. And then you're armed with that memo and you go to another bunch of lawyers and the people who are protesting are told, oh, it's all been vetted, it's all been checked out. And then you're no longer deciding whether you should commit a war crime. You're, you're trying to decide whether you should do what your commander in chief tells you is mm -hmm. lawful to do. And I do not think that we have we have very little in our culture that sort of protects against that. I, the, the only thing we have is conscience, conscience yeah. of individuals. And, and the only other thing I wanted to come back to, uh, the only, you're, Congressman Moran, you're, you're certainly right that the American people bear a great deal of collective responsibility for this as, as do our elected representatives. But I think your, your proof, right, the very passionate argument that you just made that leadership matters. The American people don't come to their views in a vacuum. They develop their views about what's important, what's not, based in part on what the people who they've elected tell them, and whether the people they've elected have consciences and are willing to speak to their consciences. So the, the political constraints I recognize are very, very real, but I also think that the, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are without some pretty substantial failures of leadership both, both in many quarters on the Hill and in the White House in some cases. Would it have been enough to change it? I don't know, maybe not. But if more people spoke as you do, we might have had a fighting chance. Okay. Uh, respond? Yeah. Uh, so I agree. <laughs> uh, the, um, there has been a, uh, a vacuum of leadership. Much of leadership, in fact, has been vacuous. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the, 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 uh, the legislative branch certainly bears responsibility, certainly the D.C. Circuit Court, which is so politicized, as was the uh, Supreme Court, at least until it became uh, tied. Uh, and, um, uh, and they could have played a, a much more constructive role. But, where do the American people get their information? They get it from broadcast television. They get it from cable. Uh, unfortunately, 52% of them apparently now get it from, uh, from YouTube or Facebook. Um, but no one 
seems to feel inhibited in expressing their opinion. But look at the blogs and the social media and so on. Who is talking about what? Nobody's talking about Guantanamo. And uh, as I want to underscore, when it is discussed, it's discussed by people on the right, these hate mongers like this Mark Levin and this Michael Savage and, and uh, you know, Hannity, Limbaugh, et al, and Fox News and so on. That's where they get their opinion. So there were a number of members of Congress who knew we were right on the facts, but they also knew that no one was watching C-SPAN. Uh, they knew that their constituents were never going to hear those facts. They did know what their constituents assumed, that this was the, these were the worst of the worst, because they had heard it. And so they get up on stage and they say it, because every, almost every politician wants to tell people what they want to hear, and this election was, was a, a prime example of that being the successful approach to to uh, political, uh, 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 to, to success in politics. So, um, yeah, you no, know, there was a, there was, a, it was devoid of leadership certainly, uh, but I, I think it's, it's much more than that. And when we talk about, you know, is this going to come back? As you raised the question, Peter, General Mattis is not going to tolerate the torture, but. The CIA and our other intelligence agencies have become far more kinetic uh, in the last, you know, 16, 20 years. Read what Mike Pompeo has said and how he has voted. Just do your own research and then come back and tell me whether you think that uh, the, the CIA, at least, uh, is going to be uh, conduct itself in as reputable fashion as I think General Mattis is going to uh, require of the military. Yeah, well, Peter, no, I, I, I just want to say I, I used to remember it, it, what Jim said struck me. I used to say to people that, you know, George Bush knows torture works Incident, because would he's you say W? Because 41 w. No, was you're right. a bad no, guy. He was a very we good guy. He was a very good guy. I like 41. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Okay, I call you. him Little George. Is that okay? <laughs> That's little George. perfectly fine. Yeah, uh, George W. George the Lesser. Or whatever, no, I used to yeah. say George, uh, George well, the Lesser. Yeah. Uh, that he knew torture worked because he had seen it on the television program 24. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the extent of his research in the air. That's the way Donald Trump reacted to it. Matt has said to him, well, maybe this doesn't work. Peter, let me tell you, you know, we're more sensitive to it. You know, the polls show more people in America. You've got to remember, when torture was undertaken, the overwhelming majority of Americans opposed torture. Yeah. Today, the polls in the United States say the overwhelming majority of Americans support torture to get, now that's an amazing, yeah. extraordinary thing. And I just want to say from, uh, I am, unfortunately, a lawyer and a litigator. I'm telling you, it's, I remember when John McCain put an amendment in saying, I ban torture. Mm -hmm. But he also supported taking away habeas corpus. I said, you know, Senator, you're for this, but how can I ever enforce it now? I'm telling you, mm -hmm. at Guantanamo for a foreigner, there's no way to get into court on this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a dangerous, dangerous time. Yeah. How many of you saw Zero Dark Thirty? It was terrible, and it was deliberate, and it was as I think it was propagandistic, yeah, yeah, yeah. misleading for America. And and we our agencies contributed much of the information they used, believing it to be wholly accurate, because uh, it was a purposeful movie in terms of the, uh, the the people who wanted to give the public that impression, and and that movie did far more to convince people of what's right and wrong on this issue than any, any words or speeches we're ever going to give. And, you know, the Senate Intelligence Report, which I think is one of the, you know, is, is, a, Feinstein. Yeah, you know. is a brilliant piece of, you know, historians are going to be re referring to this for a very long time because even the unclassified version 
you, when you look at the footnotes, there's so much detail about what was actually being said by whom. And one of the arguments that they used, the, uh, the CIA against the report was, well, you didn't interview anybody. And I actually think that's a terrible argument because I think documents don't lie, generally speaking. People forget, uh, misremember. So I, I think the fact that they actually followed the documents <laughs> Uh, was actually very useful. More, um, much more objective than subjective yes, because right. a lot of conversations give you subjective information. And, and Zero Dark Thirty, you know, as Congressman Moran said, did a great disservice to actually what happened because the overwhelming message that, that anybody who saw the film was that torture led to Bin Laden. That's really the message of the movie in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, the story is, you know, uh, that is not the factual matter. So let's open it to questions. If I could just okay, go ahead. Just follow up on the, the Senate torture report. I think it's really, it seems to me extremely si significant, not only in its own terms, yeah. but because a lot of people within the CIA must know we came that close to being done for what we did. It's been exposed. It was a terrible thing. It's been exposed so openly what a <laughs> terrible thing it was, which is one of the reasons that, another major reason that I think that we're not going to see a rush to the return of it. But, you know. I think the CIA is doing that for all. Yeah. I mean, the whole Church Commission was about this issue, right? I mean, I mean, they, the, the, go ahead, first question. Can you identify yourself and just wait for the mic because we, we're uh, live streaming as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Ilhan Kagri, and I work for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. For the which public? The Muslim Public Affairs Council. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody. I think that you are heroes. You're certainly my heroes. I want to thank you for the work that you do. And Congressman Moran, you drove me to tears, and I'm still having a hard time holding back my tears. Um, I, I woke up this morning feeling like I was Alice through the looking glass. I mean, I've spent the last couple of weeks just going <laughs> so many times that it's just it's shocking. So um, I, I really don't know what the future of this country is going to be. And in addition to worrying about American Muslims, which my organization represents, I worry about America in general, our, our country. You know, I, how can you be a patriot and not really be sick to your stomach? I, you know, it's, I, I'm very, very worried for this country. Um, in particular, the question that I have is for, uh, you know that many American Muslims are immigrants, and some of them may have gotten citizenship, but a lot of them are living here as permanent residents. I spent many, many years of my life as a permanent resident because I didn't need to become a citizen. So the question is, are those people liable to be taken to Guantanamo because they're not citizens? Um, I'm assuming you can't, you can't take citizens there, uh, but can you take those people there? And the second question is, uh, it now seems there's talk about taking away citizenship from people that were naturalized. Um, so is that a possibility that, you know, could, could that start happening that you can take away citizenship and therefore put people there. And I know that uh, you're aware, I'll just remind you that a lot of the American Muslim organizations are very concerned about um, <coughs> being uh, singled out or, or attacked in some way by being uh, sort of labeled as you know soft on terrorism or having relationships with uh, terrorists, which isn't true, but if you want to twist the truth or if you want to make something look a particular way, then it seems to be possible to do that, truth doesn't seem to matter anymore. Uh, so that's, that's also a concern. The, the second issue, that the second question I had was about um, the US military carrying out attacks which might be unconstitutional. Will, now, um, Congressman Moran, you said that General Mattis would not do that, but what about <laughs> generals in the field? If they're given a command from you know, their commanding officer that this is what I want you to do, how many of them will balk and say, you know, I'm not going to do this. What, what, what do we expect in terms of the future of our country, in terms of, you know, uh, warfare? Well, let me add, yeah. uh, you know, this is ironic because I, I, theoretically, I believe in civilian leadership of the military. But the military is far more likely to obey the command of a former general uh, or anybody in, in uniform uh, retired, but particularly a, a general, and General Mattis has uh, widespread respect. It's actually wide and deep. Uh, I think they're going to obey him. I think he's going to set a standard 
And that standard is, uh, is going to be one that we can be relatively proud of. So I don't worry as much about the military. They're going to fall into line. You know, there was an interesting story about a week ago about uh, General Mattis' reaction to somebody that had been beaten, tortured really, and, and died as a result. Uh, he insisted upon an investigation. Now, uh, and nobody really was held particularly accountable in my mind. Uh, for those who were responsible, but it bothered him enough to insist upon an investigation and he wanted it pursued. Uh, he's the top guy now and much as I like Ash Carter for many reasons, he really didn't want to be bothered about Guantanamo. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't think you're going to see extra legal stuff conducted by uh, by the military, and I don't think the military is going to want to send anybody down to uh, to Guantanamo. Now, you know there may be exceptions with uh, in the Homeland Security. I don't know. Uh, you know Kelly does. I don't. I don't think Kelly rises to the level of the, to the to, uh, uh, of uh, value-based standard that General Mattis does. Frankly, I, I, I hope this isn't going to go out across the uh, the. Uh, News network, but I, but just looking at their background, uh, you know, I and and General Mattis matters a lot more. So I don't think you're going to see that. Um, but you raise the issue of uh, you represent a, a, a trying to represent the intra, the rights of Muslim Americans, particularly, but Muslims generally. Some of this was a result of anti-Muslim bias, bigotry, really, particularly when they were rounding them up. The view, yeah. Go ahead. Raise a very good question, Tom. Yeah. About permanent residents. Well, it, it's a, it is an interesting question, and I, you know, <coughs> as I say, the the whole theory of Guantanamo is it's beyond the law for foreigners outside the sovereign territory. Um, I think if anyone, I, you know, who knows what these people could do, but if you picked up a Muslim permanent resident in the United States and tried to take them to Guantanamo to deprive them of rights, I think we'd have a very strong argument you can't do that, but you need to go to court and do it. And, and it's tough to get into court and it depends who's in the Justice Department opposing you. And you count in the end on the federal judiciary, which right now is probably okay because we've had some years of good appointments. But that's what you count on. And if they're gutless or don't do things, then you're, you're in trouble. So it's not 100% clear. Let, let me echo also what Jim said about the military. In my whole Guantanamo fight for the last 15 years, strongest supporters were military people who were appalled by the torture, appalled by the uh, trying to get out of the Geneva Conventions. I mean, not little guys down at the bottom who were doing things. But most of the people who studied that the greatest supporters were the military. They were appalled. And you've got to remember, it was the civilians in the George W. Bush administration <laughs> who overrode them to torture, to do everything, and, and with Guantanamo. So, it, you know, I'm more worried about these crazy civilians. The only cautionary note I would add, and I agree with everything that's just been said, is that it doesn't take a lot of people. I mean, part of what we saw in the Bush administration when, when we went to things like waterboarding, waterboarding was uh, certain senior members of the administration, Dick Cheney in particular, being willing to bypass normal decision-making processes and indeed bypass the chain of command in some respects in the military. Yeah. Uh, and we, it's true, I think. Has the CIA been burned? Does the CIA think, we, as, a, as an institution writ large, oh, we want nothing more to do with torture? Sure, but you don't need the CIA on board. You need two or three or four people willing to keep a secret. That's all you need. So I, I, don't, I don't feel particularly secure that we can say, oh, we you know, close the book on that nasty chapter of American history. You know, as, as with everything else, it's sort of, it's only as strong as having people all the time being willing to say, whoa, no, and I, you know, will we get that? I hope so. Um, 
the only other thing that I think is maybe worth drawing out here, and, and this, is, this is a broader point, much broader than any of the issues that have been raised here, um, I do think we've just had an object lesson in the ways in which uh, the, the methods of influence have changed in this country. And all of us, uh, because of our age, because of, because of sort of where we sit in our roles in the world, you know, we're kind of old school. We think that the way you change things is you write op-eds in the New York Times and you go on C-SPAN and, and you bring court cases and you, you know, have a litigation and elite-based strategy for changing people's minds. And that, it's not that that was wrong or has no place, but I think this entire election has just been a forceful reminder that fewer and fewer Americans are even tracking any of that, much less being profoundly influenced by it. And, and that the combination of, of social media, of, of Hollywood and TV storytelling, uh, of, of you know, the rise of so-called fake news, which is obviously not in itself a new phenomenon, but can certainly spread much faster now, uh, are all things that really push those of us in the sort of traditional you know, liberal advocacy communities to really rethink our strategies for communication and advocacy. And, and I think that's something that we have only just made the tiniest baby steps towards doing. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be a huge challenge. Well, can I raise the question of that? That's my thing. What do you do about that? I still think, you know, litigation strategy might not be a way to influence public opinion, but if you can count, and this is the way the country was set up, uh, if you have an objective, impartial judiciary, you can still bring legal cases to it. That's why Guantanamo was so tough. There's no legal recourse. You depend on public opinion. And the, so that's one thing. The other thing, I mean, we really should think broader. That's why I say, honestly, uh, the civic education programs and Justice O'Connor's is, ex is excellent, talking to people about what the role of a citizen is, what the role is to learn the correct facts, to distinguish between truth and falsity. I mean, these are important things. We need to think more broadly in how to combat the problems of America today. So, I agree. Mm -hmm. Peter? I just want okay, to, in, in discussing warfare, the thing we haven't mentioned, which is obviously a, a factor, I think, is that the Bush administration program was one of detention, interrogation, torture, indef indefinite detention without charge or trial. The drone program was something that became much bigger under Obama. And, and when we're looking at warfare, that's clearly something that it seems to me Trump is going to inherit. And what is he going to do with it? Well, that and goes uh, back to the loaded gun question. And you know, uh, work that David and I do on the drone program. You know, there's been a pause in Pakistan of seven months, um, and there's a whole raft of reasons why that might be the case. But it could be the Trump people have said some very uh, interesting mixed messages, both on the question of the use of drones and our relations with Pakistan. Um, so the loaded gun <coughs> is there, um, and just by way, just an observation here. Even if you take the most conservative estimates of people killed in drone strikes, which we track very closely, uh, President Obama has killed four times more people than President Bush put in Guantanamo. That's using the most conservative estimates. If you use higher, uh, sort of more liberal estimates, the number goes up to five times. I mean, it's just an interesting observation because at the end of the day, being killed on a drone or going to Guantanamo, those are both very bad outcomes uh, yeah. for all concerned. And as Rosa <coughs> indicated, the legal framework surrounding both of these decisions are not dissimilar, right? And uh, I just thought it was worth having that in mind when we were all thinking about Guantanamo and definite yeah. detention torture. We need to think yes. about drones as well. As and you know, just to uh, kind of another thing Obama has done to his credit, uh, in May, I get a, every day I get a, a press release from CENTCOM, and in May, suddenly, they said, we've taken a strike in Yemen. I thought, wow, that's very interesting <coughs> that they're actually saying this in a press release that they sent out every day. They didn't say, by the way, we're changing our policy completely. They just, and you know, in this daily press release. So they have migrated the drone program, and you know, going to what Congressman Moran was saying, if it's done by the Defense Department, generally speaking, it is more transparent, there is more kind of just a general sense. Um, so again, we should give Obama his due. Uh, he has released a lot of people from Guantanamo. 
the drone program has migrated more into a more, slightly more transparent form-ish. <laughs> this gentleman here. Hi, and, uh, and thank you. This is a, this is a great panel. Uh, my name is Seth Farber. Um, I am, I suppose, an independent journalist. I'm an attorney by trade, actually, in the, with an unnamed public sector employer. At one time, I worked for the United States Department of Justice. Tom was a classmate of George W. I was a classmate of Barack Obama. <laughs> sort of an amusing <laughs> coincidence. Um, my independent journalism is something called The Talking Dog. I've had occasion actually to interview a number of people, including Andy and Tom, uh, uh, amazingly about 10 years ago when we thought this would have um, ended a really long time ago. Um, I note Rosas uh, mentioned uh, the Jackson descent in Korematsu. Um, Congressman Moran also mentioned the Japanese uh, internment as well, along with um, treatment of native persons, slavery, uh, other um, black marks that uh, unfortunately we have an awful lot of them. Uh, I suppose leading right up to Guantanamo, this is actually the second time we've used Guantanamo to intern foreign persons. The um, uh, President Clinton and uh, Bush also used Guantanamo to detain Haitian persons who um, were particularly believed to have HIV, uh, but mostly had the misfortune of That's being... That's what the question? So the question is uh, basically uh, at Guantanamo, uh, very few people there uh, look like the people in this room. They are uh, Middle Eastern persons, um, people of color. And so the question is, I believe that's actually uh, a huge part of the difficulty in gaining a constituency. I have no doubt in my mind that George W. Bush is not a racist. I have no doubt in my mind that Barack Obama is not a racist. I have no doubt in my mind that Donald J. Trump is a racist. Under those circumstances, my question, is there an opportunity, in fact, at this moment in history to treat this as what it is, a racial issue, and the fact that the election of Donald Trump actually presents an opportunity to pitch the narrative of Guantanamo on those terms, particularly in the event he intends to do anything in Andy's category uh, in the uh, beyond merely bad into the very bad or very, very bad. And my answer is no. It's a good answer. Next question? For a number of reasons. Well, <laughs> I think there's, you know, I think there's unfortunately so much racism has been revealed that, that exposing that is not going to be popular. But I think that it's always important every now and then when we're dealing with these issues to remind any audience that we come across, who is at Guantanamo? These people are all Muslims. Replace the word Muslims with any other group of people that are held there and see how it sounds when you say that and you realize how racist the entire project is. So, you know, and it's something that it can be forgotten. This can be about the injustice, and it is about the injustice, but the victims of this injustice are all Muslims and that, you know, that remains something that should be shameful to all of us. Well, and from a political standpoint, I mean, I, I agree with Jim, but from a political standpoint, you're right. There's no constituency for you know, several hundred, and now 55, Muslim men. You know, who, who do they, who stands up for them in, in Congress, other than people like Jim, who don't have, there's no constituent interest, so. Lady here. I was a big Bernie Sanders supporter, and there are a lot of people there who were very concerned about people of color and Muslims and every other damn thing that wasn't white. And I would like to say that maybe Obama did fail us, and I think the Democratic Party failed us, and the Democratic Party leadership failed us, and they're still trying to fail us by, by keeping Bernie Sanders out of the mainstream of uh, party politics in this country. So with all due respect, Mr. Moran, I think you were a terrific congressman, but I think you're, you're, old, you're old school. There's a new generation coming up and they want to deal with these problems. And they will if a lot of the dinosaurs will get out of the way and give them space. I think you're being quite unfair. Congressman Moran led the charge in Congress to get this place closed. 
Uh, that may be. That may be, but I don't remember him supporting uh, Bernie Sanders. I don't remember a lot of people who did some very good things supporting Bernie Sanders. Well, but that's not really what we're discussing. Well, no, about. but I, I know yeah. what she's saying. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I came into the Congress with Bernie. Uh, and uh, I also knew Peter Smith, uh, who Bernie defeated, and uh, since you've raised the issue. And... Uh, and, and Bernie defeated Peter because Peter voted for the assault weapons ban that George H.W. Bush uh, uh, advocated and signed into law. But Bernie had the support of the NRA, and in Vermont, that was decisive. And uh, when Bernie wanted seniority on committees, I did oppose it. So you're absolutely right in criticizing me. And I, I told Bernie, I only asked one thing, if you want to gain seniority through the Democratic Party, tell us you're a Democrat. And he would not. So I admire Bernie on so many issues. He's terrific. And he's great on Guantanamo. He didn't speak once on this issue on the floor of the House. And I don't think he's ever spoken on the floor of the Senate on Never this did. issue either. Never did. So back at you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, let me yeah. say, I went to Bernie when, when they revoked habeas corpus. After we won the right to habeas corpus in the Supreme Court, Congress then revoked it. And I went through the Senate, senator by senator, to try to get them to restore it, and Bernie did not support it. Now, isn't that amazing? It's well, I mean, okay, but you know. Move on. Yeah, it's time to this, move on. For this, this gentleman here. to the idea that perhaps um, the election of Donald Trump in an ironic way will be more beneficial to the Guantanamo detainees and maybe even to, with regard to dr drone warfare, because international human rights organizations and maybe even the appellate district courts have been complicit with the Obama administration, whereas they will be maybe more hostile to whatever Trump is doing. Does, does anybody have any thoughts with regard to that? Well, I'm not, not sure on that point, but you should know Andy and I just had an, an op-ed co-authored in the New York Daily News when we, and we pitched it to Guantanamo. Unfortunately, they changed the title. We had the title, Guantanamo, a bad deal for America. And we went through it, so you know how it's not working how the fact is you put people down there to try them before commissions, and they can't be tried if you put them in the federal courts, it makes sense. It's costing $11 million a person to keep them there. For my guys, take a clear-eyed business view of this, be a businessman, and you can get the job done of saving money for America. It could be more, it could be better that way. In terms of the courts, you know, the Justice Department will probably be far more hostile to Guantanamo than even the Obama Justice Department. So I, I don't see it being helpful that way. But I, honestly, if I think if we can embarrass Trump, if you say, why are you spending $11 million a person, could, could help. I don't think they've been giving him a pass by any means. Uh, but I think that the Obama administration had a lot of goodwill, not just in the human rights, human rights organizations, but in allied governments, um, which maybe went a little easier on some of the U.S.'s positions than they, they could have. Um, uh, and, and, and I've certainly had <coughs> friends inside the administration who, who care about these issues say in some frustration you know, I will sit in on the meeting with the president and a representative of an allied European country, and they will be very polite and they'll really soft pedal. And then out in the hall, they'll say to me, "And you, U.S., you shouldn't do this. This is terrible." And I'll say, "Why didn't you say that to the president?" So uh, there's some of that to be sure, and maybe there will be less of that with Donald Trump. But but a, I unfortunately the 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 wave of uh, right wing populism that led to Trump's election is obviously. We're not the only country experiencing that, so I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic that we will have allies who will help, help push us in, in a better direction in the next few years. I, I think it's anybody's guess, right? I, I mean, this is, this is, I think, I don't know, the umpteenth panel I've sat on where, where part of the 
ideas to prognosticate on what's going to happen in the next four years under Trump, and none of us have the faintest idea, frankly. You know, do the cooler heads, the Jim Mattises and others prevail? Does Trump care? Is there, can he be embarrassed? Is, does any argument appeal to him? Does he get bored with being president after 10 minutes and delegate it to somebody else? We don't know. We have no idea. You know, will this end up being a galvanizing moment in which all those young Bernie Sanders supporters say, oh, I wasn't an activist enough. I need to get out there. I need to do more. And that changes the dynamic. Or does this turn into a moment where everybody just gets depressed and the, the wave of populism behind Trump is the future? I, I think we don't know the, the only piece of that that gives me some hope is, is to paraphrase Barack Obama, you know, the, the future is us, essentially, that we, what happens depends on what we do. So let's try to figure out which future we prefer and get busy making it happen. Let, let, let me say one more thing, because I don't mean to denigrate in any way what you say. I think there is some truth to it. You know, I, I've been involved in this for so long. Um, it was much easier under Bush to oppose Guantanamo and to get press on it and to get coverage. When Obama came around, and it's one of the reasons, Jim, and we'll talk about it separately, uh, Obama kept saying, oh, I really want to close it, but I can't. I'm doing my best. And he said that even, he said, I, you know, I, I, I don't think he was, but we couldn't get traction with the press. Nobody would criticize him because he was on our side. When somebody's not, you know, I think it, it will be easier to build up support again. You know, the fact is, very few people care about Guantanamo before. When Obama was elected, I, I said 60 percent of the people in the country wanted to close it, both because he and McCain had done it because Bush was fourth. So there might be a play here. Well, also, we've had eight years of, you know, the most outrageous, unprincipled behavior by the Republican Party against President Obama, not just on Guantanamo, but specifically on Guantanamo, their, their behavior has been appalling. And, and how easy was it to do? It was very easy for them to do it because they didn't own the place, you know? The Republican Party are going to be now back in charge of it. And it's very, very different. Hopefully, there will be significant international criticism again. If he tries any of the outrageous things that he's proposed, um, hopefully, there will be, those voices will be raised loudly internationally and pressure will be exerted. But I, I think there, can, there cannot but be a change. Similarly, there's a change because, you know, Liberals, Democrats are prepared to, to criticize in a way that throughout much of Obama's time, they didn't. There's time for a couple more questions, so let's just uh, take the questions. Uh, <coughs> we'll take them together so that we have time to answer them. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Matrovsky. Um, so I think we pretty well established what wrong looks like. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, sort of presuming that um, fighting violent non-state actors is, is going to be an enduring issue for a while. What's What's sort of the right way to um, meet the security requirements that, that sort of comes with that without necessarily compromising the values that we've, we've um, you know, we try to adhere to? Great question. Um, this gentleman here. Yeah, Ken Meyercourt, World Ducks. Um, she said I, that too fast. I didn't hear it. What? Come on, Congressman. We know each other. Right. Ken Meyercourt. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, has Khalid Sheikh bin Mohammed been allowed to tell his story in his own words? Okay. Um, I've got a I, I was hoping that'd be a quick no, but uh, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> if I could go on that, yeah. uh, could it be that uh, Obama's uh, refusal to close Guantanamo derives from the fact that that someone explained to him if you did close Guantanamo and put KSM someplace where he could tell his own story in his own words? whether you lock him up in a domestic prison for life, it would so contradict the story in the 9-11 Commission report as to make a mockery of that report. Okay, good. We have five minutes left, so let's uh, use the time wisely. Um, and final thoughts from all the panelists. Responding to the question. Uh, okay, the last, I, I'm not sure I heard your whole question. Okay. That's a problem. Well, so what, what, given the fact that we will be at war with non-state actors for the foreseeable future, what is the legal regime in, in terms of detention that would make sense? I think I would somewhat question an implied premise that we, we should think of ourselves as at war with all of these actors. I mean, non-state actors covers everything from ISIS to Amnesty International to ExxonMobil, right? It, that's, that's a pretty big, 
you know, the, the fact that we are facing security threats from certain non-state actors in certain places, I, I think that we have, some of those security threats are very real. We have to take them seriously. That does not necessarily mean that we should conceptualize any or certainly not all of those threats through a legal framework that relates to the law of armed conflict. Some of those security threats, uh, among other things, I think we need to do a better job as a nation of, of disaggregating the threats, distinguishing between very different kinds of organizations with quite different agendas, quite different abilities to do harm to the US, even aside from what their agendas are. We need to disaggregate them and we need to keep the potential harms in perspective. I think we have come to treat terrorism as an existential threat, which it is not at this point. I mean, barring some Nuclear extremely weapon. unlikely event, yeah. it won't be. Uh, we are, our political discourse tends to wildly exaggerate the nature of the threat, even as it lumps together quite disparate organizations and individuals with quite disparate agendas. So I do think that as we work to combat the threats, some of which, as I said, are real and we need to take quite seriously, you know, we need to, we need to have a sensible approach that is calibrating our responses to the very specific nature of the threat itself. And that's gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say anything that's not on some level a cliche, but it's true. You know, we need to use all of the tools at our disposal, law enforcement tools, intelligence tools. Sometimes military force is absolutely gonna be appropriate. But I think that most of the, the threats to our values arise from our tendency to lump together and exaggerate the, the harm that can be done by, by many, many different groups with many different interests, issues, and capabilities. As a legal matter, can I say from a detention standpoint, how does this matter practically? We have a system, the Anglo-American system, where you really, with one exception, can lock people up in prison only after a charge and a trial. The exception to that is somebody caught in war who can be held out to the end of the war. And the question here is, when is a war? Do we extend the war so you can lock people up? And this is just from detention, I'm not that. Uh, do you extend that to people who are not state actors who are terrorists? And I think it's a mistake to do so. I think there is a mistake in our system when there's a crisis, a lot of countries say, oh, we need to invent a new system. Well, that's what's been wrong. Our old system actually works quite well. And people who were caught in Afghanistan in a war held out to the end of it. People who are terrorists from Bosnia or anything else are really, under domestic law and international law, they're criminals. If somebody who tries to kill innocent civilians, uh, you know, that's a criminal activity. And our criminal system can handle that quite well. It handles it much better than what we've done to try to avoid the system. You can really, you know, you could use military means to capture people, you know, to get them. I mean, you can use also, but how you detain them then depends what they are. If, if this guy really has done this, or is a really, we have a raft of laws that allow us to convict them and imprison them. You don't need to avoid those laws to keep them without charge or trial. So, that's my view. I, I, I think Tom said that very well. It, it, it disturbs me that the war on terrorism is ubiquitous and never ending. It's, it's just gonna go on forever as long as it's politically convenient. And there's always gonna be acts of terrorism. Uh, you know, they, 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 they so-called enemies, many of whom are real enemies, no, no question about them, uh, but they're gonna morph. Uh, they're, they're always gonna metastasize. And so um, I, I think we've, uh, you know, the, the intent was to be able to keep these people indefinitely out of the legal system, and they're gonna be successful in that. There was a time when we thought the War on terrorism was over, there was a, when the Cold War was over, et cetera. Uh, we're in a different time, and, and I think it has a profound impact upon uh, the, uh, uh, the judicial approach uh, to this, and it's an adverse one. Um, in terms of KSM, 
uh, you know, I haven't heard the whole story. I can tell you I've heard lots of people telling me, uh, you know, what, and it's, it's, uh, I, I, it doesn't give me any qualms that he has been treated, frankly, the way he has. But I, I was struck by the guy who uh, actually uh, interviewed uh, Saddam Hussein. And um, he was the only one who got the full interview. He spoke Arabic and so on. He, he interviewed him at the, at the right time. Turned out that Saddam Hussein wasn't even involved in running the government at the time. He had turned that over. He was writing a book. And I, you know, when, when we invade, he thought we were coming in to rescue him from the extremists. Uh, you know, he, was, he was out of it. Uh, it's just an interesting footnote on history. The guy that actually did the interview has written a book now. Nobody's going to read it. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating, uh, you know, between what we are told and what the facts prove themselves to be. I, at this point, I still assume that KSM is who he has been depicted as being, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the more accurate information, uh, verifiable information, the better as far as I'm concerned. Andy? Well, I just, you know, to conclude, I'd just like to say that I have, I have never stopped thinking that what we had in place before the 9-11 attacks was sufficient for dealing with threats that we encountered. That people who, and Tom mentioned the Geneva Convention, if you capture people in wartime, you can hold them until the end of hostilities. They have the protections of the Geneva Conventions. One of the things that's become very endangered during the last 15 years of the war on terror, or whatever we're calling it now, are the Geneva Conventions. And, uh, you know, and I think that it's important to look at that. And you know, I hope we've established very well today that if somebody is accused of terrorism, then they should be put on trial. And the best fo place for that I is federal court. And we have, we're now 15 years into this horrendous confusion of terrorists and soldiers and civilians, and everything has been turned on its head. None of it worked. It's very unfortunate to me that we are now sitting here with Obama about to leave, Guantanamo still open, and Donald Trump about to come in, because we were slowly moving in the right direction towards the final closure of this place. And, um, and I know that people have all kinds of ideas about Hillary Clinton, but I think it's fair to say that we could have seen this place close had she become the president. She's not. We're going to have Donald Trump. So I think that everybody who cares about this has to deal with this the same way. Donald, there is <laughs> unfinished business here, and it needs to be done. And, uh, and we cannot accept this anymore. I don't want us to be here again in another year. I don't want us to be here forever, because the, the truth is what it's always been to me, that Guantanamo is a legal, moral, and ethical abomination. It should not exist. Every minute of its existence is an insult to the values that decent Americans claim to hold, and that it must be closed. Thank you. Thank you for a brilliant discussion. Thank you to our panelists very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Jim, we've got to get you.